remarkable to think that our planet may be the only place in the cosmos with life. Now, we all take our planet for granted, but I'm here to tell you that it's time to protect our precious planet, because without it, we don't exist. I'm an environmental scientist, driven by a passion for our planet, but also by a saddening of what we're doing to it. I've dedicated my career to exploring solutions to environmental problems, particularly those faced by tropical forests. And this has enabled me to see just how our planet is a living, breathing masterpiece of nature. And my dream is that of a world where humans and nature can thrive together. My work has taken me around the equator, from Africa and Asia to the Amazon, where I've witnessed Earth's wonders, felt its power, but also its fragility. And of course, spending extended periods in tropical forests has certainly not come without its hiccups. I really have wrestled an anaconda. I've awoken in the night to find every inch of me and my hammock covered in ants. I've been simultaneously attacked by a bat, a swarm of bees, and a possum while wearing nothing but my underpants. <laughs> I've lost fl flesh from my buttocks. Twice. And I've been stalked by this jaguar. And with all of these experiences has come a great respect of nature. Covered in ants, I knew the best thing to do was just to stay still and let all 150,000 of the colony just walk over me. Faced up by this wild jaguar, I stayed calm, and eventually he just sat down, and we stared at each other for about half an hour. But it's not just the scary moments that have inspired my love of nature. It's what I've learned about the natural world that has really sparked my passion. Indeed, I have learned that plants, animals, and all living things are vital for making our planet habitable. They gift us clean air, clean water, and nutrients. And they pollinate our farms, just like this hummingbird feeding on a banana flower. If we had to pay for all of the things that ecosystems do for us, it would cost us a staggering $46 trillion a year. And that's a scary number equal to half of our global economy. So thank you to things like these natural flood defenses provided by mangroves and the animals that pollinate our farms. And through my research, I have shown that without animals, forests struggle to regenerate because there is no one to disperse the seeds of the most important and largest trees. And this is crucial because forests are our first line of defense against dangerous climate change. And we learn from nature, too. Countless technological advances come from the natural world. Velcro was inspired by plants. And new hydrophobic materials, like those on my coat here, get their surface structure from lilies. And this is what we call biomimicry. When professional swimsuits were redesigned to mimic the fine-scale structure of shark skin, they were banned after the 2008 Olympics, when too many world records were shattered. So nature is amazing. Did you know that through their root networks, trees gift nutrients to one another? And it's the largest and oldest, and maybe the wisest, trees that do the most giving. In essence, they are communicating. And trees aren't just really cool. They're sophisticated carbon dioxide hoovers. And it's not just trees. Recent science shows the importance of grasslands, soils, and even whales for locking greenhouse gas emissions out of our atmosphere. And if that wasn't enough, nature helps our health, too. Scientists in the field are now unanimous that the more people spend time in nature, the happier they are, the lower their stress levels, and the physically healthier they are. 
Medical doctors have now even started prescribing a dose of nature. But the best thing about the natural world is when two species help each other. And this is called symbiosis. My favorite symbiotic relationship of all is that between the acacia tree and the acacia ant. The ant lives exclusively on the tree, which it fiercely defends. It even destroys seedlings on the forest floor that may compete with the tree for soil nutrients. In return, the ant receives food, shelter, and a place to lay its eggs. Together, the two species thrive, but alone, they are outcompeted. We only exist because of symbiosis, too. Our gut microbiome, that is, all those microorganisms that live within our digestive tract, are vital for our immune system and our digestion. There are more bacterial cells in our bodies than there are human cells. And without them, we simply can't survive. But despite the fact that nature is the only reason we're here, scientists believe we're now at a crossroads. On one side, an environmental catastrophe, where we do too little, too late. On the other, a hope. A hope that we might just be able to turn things around. Indeed, a realization that we have to. Now, I don't believe in a world for future generations where we continue to exist beyond the means of our fragile planet, using machines to suck greenhouse gas emissions out of the atmosphere. No, I believe in a world where humans can be humans, but we value and respect Earth's riches and harness them for the benefit of all of us. But our planet is suffering from its own pandemic. The actions of humans have been compared to that of a virus on its host. But actually, we're more like an asteroid. And as a result, scientists are concerned that Earth has entered its sixth mass extinction. And I probably don't need to tell you what happened the last time we had one of those. Earth lost the dinosaurs. So it's hard to overstate our impact on the planet. We're not on the verge of a crisis. It's already begun. The Earth is warming. Forests are burning. And our homes are flooding. One million species are threatened with extinction, and we could be one of them. This century alone, 300 million people will be displaced by sea level rise. Last year, there were more climate refugees than there were fleeing conflict. Poverty, hunger, injustice and inequality, as well as species extinctions, are set to get worse. So we need rapid action. And if the COVID pandemic has taught us anything, it's taught us that rapid action is possible if the cause is great enough. Well, Earth's pandemic is more than great enough, and the prosperity of our children and their children depends on what we do today. So here's my kids, ready for action and ready to see the world. Now, I'd like to think that, like me, they will see magnificent animals in the wild, breathe fresh air, and live generally healthy lives. But I fear that they may not. So we need to act now. But governments are simply not doing enough, and most nations are nowhere near meeting their climate targets. So as individuals, we all need to up our game. We need to wake up to the fact that we are over-consuming. It's mad to think that just half of us contribute 86% of all greenhouse gas emissions. We are consuming too much, and food is a big one. And this is important because food production is the largest driver of climate change and contributes a third of all of our greenhouse gas emissions. 
So what can we do? Well, we need to start looking at the impacts of our diets. This is actually a bit of a minefield. I'll explain. You may have heard that a meat-based diet has the highest environmental footprint, and this is true. Meat is so inefficient because it requires large areas of land for every kilogram of food produced. And as a result, meat production accounts for more greenhouse gas emissions than those from the entire transport sector combined, including planes. And beef is a particular issue, because even your local cows were probably fed on feed grown on land that was previously forest, not to mention the methane that cattle produce. And so the majority of emissions from meat are occurred when ecosystems are destroyed to make way for food, particularly tropical forests. And this is one of the reasons you may have heard bad things about palm oil. But even palm oil is more nuanced than you might think, because it's more efficient with the land, particularly compared to the alternative oils. And another fact that may surprise you: genetically modified foods are better for the environment because they're kinder on the land, and because they are tolerant to extreme weather events. They are also important in the fight against famine too. And when you think about the season of what we eat, for example, in the UK, out-of-season asparagus emits 18 times more than it does in-season, and is not dissimilar from beef or lamb. And the nuance doesn't stop there. Bananas that travel by boat from Latin America have the same carbon emissions as those of broccoli grown in the UK. So I think we need to get food smart. There are fortunately a few general rules to help us to do this. I took these pictures on my supermarket shop: twelve apples, six from South Africa and six from here in the UK. A pretty easy decision. Out-of-season beans from Kenya or Morocco? I don't even know. So let's just keep it simple. Eating less meat is the surest way to reduce the impact of your diet. And it's easier on your wallet too. Sourcing products sourced locally usually reduces their environmental footprint, and eating in season helps too. But unfortunately, our overconsumption goes way beyond that of just food. We also come to the temptations of fast fashion and the buy and buy more system. We all consume energy, polluting plastics and fossil fuels. So we can smarten up our consumption of all things: grow your own, waste less, reuse things, repair things, buy and sell secondhand. We don't need to stop consuming; we just need to reduce our overconsumption. So if you're just starting out, try Meat Free Monday, or buy less unnecessary crap October. And you can make yourself simple targets for our planet. Here's my Earth Smart Meter. It's just like the reward chart that my kids have on the fridge, and I call it a smart meter because 40% of people with a smart energy meter actually consume less energy. Yet, like my reward chart, all it does is show you your usage. So I'm on this journey with you, because we can all do better. And we need to start talking about Earth's pandemic. If we shout loud enough, we might just give world leaders no choice but to take real action. Tell your politicians to give us climate labelling on products, especially food. We label GM, so why not label its emissions too? And while you're at it, ask for a solar panel on every roof. If you own Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. All over the world, spread algorithms that promote the word about the environment. If you own a global corporation, put Earth's pandemic at the top of your agenda, and use your power and influence to start an environmental revolution. 
If you can afford to go to space, how about we fix our planet too? So I leave you with the future generations of our planet. I'm making changes for them, and you can too. Everything we do, every day, makes a difference. So let's be more like the acacia ant and care for the very thing that provides for us. We have to, because life on Earth doesn't have another planet to go to. So now is the time to protect our precious planet. Thank you.